Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, so righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Please rise as we sing together hymn number 463. I sing the mighty power of God. Hymn number 463. <laughs>
Professor says by kneeling before our God. stand and lift up your heads to hear the good news, which this morning comes to us from Romans chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, where it says, For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. Jesus' death sets you free from sin and death. Jesus' death means you have eternal life. You are the people of God. It doesn't matter what you think, it doesn't matter what you feel, but what matters is what the Word of God declares. Therefore, as a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, I declare to you, the people of God, that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is fitting and right to do so. Truly, it is fitting, right, and beneficial to give thanks to you at all times and in every place. O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God. Therefore, the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, and with the church on earth, we praise and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Activities, 
but the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of, of the body, though they are many, are one, so it is with Christ. For in the Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand in respect for the reading of the Gospel. Our Gospel text is John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to you, o Christ. Come home 
And in the days before email, we'd get letters from him, building our anticipation. And suddenly, he was there, coming through the front door. The Holy Spirit mysteriously came and went in the Old Testament. And this built up great anticipation in his absence. This Pentecost morning, we'll see the longing of Moses' generation and know the fulfillment of their longing for the presence of the Spirit because he's here. He's here. Go and open up your Bibles to Numbers chapter 11. We're going to start there, verse 24. Numbers chapter 11, verse 24. And it starts off there in verse 24 in Numbers chapter 11 by saying, So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Now we're plopping down in the middle of Numbers chapter 11. You're probably wondering what's going on here. Well, the Israelites have been grumbling. They're grumbling against God about the manna, the bread from heaven that they received. They've been going on close to a year now as they've come out of Egypt and their slavery. And this was to be a temporary state. You've seen how the Israelites wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. That wasn't how it was supposed to be. They were supposed to very quickly come out of Egypt and go into the promised land. And so God temporarily provides for them manna, bread from heaven. They also receive water from the rock. And when they went into the land, they were to inherit everything that was there. All the produce of the land would be theirs. All the farms and villages would be theirs. They would spoil the Canaanites, but they complained instead. They grumbled against God about their manna. They were concerned about their diet because it was too simple. They wanted more variety. And so they grumbled and complained against the Lord. And we read these words in Numbers 11, verse 1. And the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. When the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outlying parts of the camp. Now, when they were brought out of Egypt, you may remember, God pours out many plagues upon the land of Egypt, brings his people out. Why? Because they cried out to him in their distress in slavery. And so God brings them out of the land, takes them through the Red Sea, destroys the Egyptian army. The Egyptians give over all their treasures when the Israelites leave. So they're a wealthy nation when they go out of the land, and yet they grumble, and yet they complain. And so the pillar of smoke that went by day became a pillar of fire at night. The presence of God with the people of God, leading them on their way, protecting them from enemies all around. We see now that as the people complain against the Lord, the pillar of fire, the fire of the Lord, burned among them and consumed the outer parts of the camp, became judgment for Israel. So we see in verse 16, Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them take their stand there with you. The tent of meeting, the tabernacle, the presence of God. Now notice that these Israelite elders are to be brought around the tabernacle. The people are told that this will happen. The entire nation of Israel is probably watching what's going on down at the tabernacle. And there at the tabernacle, the Lord gathered the 70 together, and he comes and meets with them. Now notice, these elders do not enter the tabernacle. They're not priests. They're not of the tribe of Levi. They're not of the household of Aaron. And so they stand around the outside of the tabernacle as the Lord gathers them. Verse 25. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. God's glory cloud comes. His presence came down upon his house. The cloud that was with Israel, that came down on Mount Sinai, where God's presence was, that filled the tabernacle, that speaks with Moses, now comes down and speaks with Moses at the tabernacle in the presence of the 70 elders. Now notice that prior to this tabernacle, you may remember this, God came down and spoke with Moses. 
Now, sometimes people get confused because they see this tent of meeting in the book of Exodus, and then you see the tabernacle. It's also called the tent of meeting, and you wonder, what is this? But prior to the construction of the tabernacle, Moses also had a tent that he placed and pitched outside the camp. And there, while he was waiting until the construction of the tabernacle, and the consecration was complete of the tabernacle, Moses on the edge of the camp met with God. God would come down. God would come in his glory cloud and speak with Moses. And then Moses would come out from the glory of God. Having seen the Shekinah glory of God, his face shone brightly. And the people of Israel were frightened of him, and so he veiled his face. But when the tabernacle was constructed, when the priests were set apart, when the elements were consecrated, then the time for that tent came to an end. And we've got the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, where the priests are, where God's presence is, where the 70 elders have gathered now. And God comes down in the pillar of smoke, and he speaks with Moses. He speaks with Moses, and the Spirit comes and rests on them, upon these elders, and they began to prophesy. The same Spirit that was on Moses, the same Spirit of God that we see with only one other person up to this point in time. And maybe you remember who that other man was. It's fascinating. Anybody remember what tribe Moses was from? He was a Levite. He was from the priestly tribe. So his brother Aaron becomes the high priest. We read in Exodus chapter 35 and verse 30 about the other man that the Spirit came on. Then Moses said to the people of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship. So we got one man, Moses, from the tribe of Levi, from the priestly tribe, who the Spirit comes on. And the only other man at this point that's mentioned in this way is Bezalel from the royal tribe of Judah. The Spirit comes on him. He's an artist. He's a craftsman. He oversees the construction of the tabernacle in God's house. Even as Moses oversees the people who will go into that house, the priests. And so, up to this point, the Spirit rests on Moses and the Spirit rests on Bezalel, but now the Spirit's breaking out. He goes on the 70 elders to show the people of God that the elders have the favor of the Lord. Listen to them. Listen to them. The elders prophesied by the Spirit. Now, we live in a time and a place where you turn on TV on Sunday morning, and you'll see people prophesying, right? They'll say nebulous things that are hard to prove one way or the other. Or they'll say things that are really inconsequential. But prophecy can mean two things in the Bible. It can mean foretelling something that's going to happen. But more commonly, it means proclamation of the things of God. Notice what the prophets oftentimes did in Israel. They came and warned the people of God. They came and warned them and spoke to them the things of God and told them to turn back to God. And here we see that these elders have the Spirit come upon them. I don't think they're proclaiming things out of their minds. I don't think they're saying things that nobody understands and needs to be interpreted. I think they're proclaiming in the hearing of the people of God, the things of God. They speak by the power of the Spirit. They proclaim God's news. And then it says it went away. It was temporary. But they did not continue doing it. Verse 26. Now two men remained in the camp. One named Eldad, the other named Magad, and the Spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but had not gone out to the tent. And so they prophesied in the camp to show the sovereign, uncontrollable, at least in the eyes of men, nature of God's powerful Spirit, who goes where he wills, like the wind and does as he sees fit, moving his people along mysteriously like the wind. We see that God comes and rests on these two elders who did not show up at the tabernacle. We're not told why. We're not told if it was a good reason or if it was a bad reason. But they're out in the midst of the camp. Now, the tabernacle would have been pitched in the middle of Israel. All the tribes arranged around it. All the people of God watching, seeing what is God doing, watching the tabernacle. And suddenly out in the camp, these two elders who didn't show up at the tabernacle have the Spirit come upon them, and they too begin to prophesy just like the other elders. 
What does this mean? Well, I'll tell you one thing for sure. It tells us God's going to do what God's going to do. And God's going to do it where he wishes to do it. I don't know about you, brother, but I see incidents like what happened yesterday in London. I see great Christian nations heading down the drain, circling the drain. I look at our nation, where when I became a Christian just 30 years or so ago, our nation was about 80% proclaiming the name of Christ. Now we're down around 70 and threatened to dip below it. Pretty soon we're going to be in the 60s, just like England was back in the 1980s. And I wonder, Lord, why? Won't you send your spirit powerfully upon us and revive us once again? Won't you make your kingdom great in our land again? Won't you fill your churches again and cause us to believe, O oh Lord? But God's going to do what God's going to do. And he's going to do it where he wishes. He's going to pour out his spirit like he's doing in Iran. Iran, the birthplace of modern Islamic fundamentalism of all places in the world. God's been pouring out his spirit powerfully, particularly in the last 10 years. The underground church movement there is exploding. Some estimate there may be a million Christians in Iran now who converted in the recent decades. God's pouring out his spirit in India upon the untouchables there. God's pouring out his spirit in the prison camps of North Korea. God's kingdom is alive and well and moving more powerfully than it ever has in the history of the world. And yet sometimes we wonder, why not us, O oh Lord? And yet we need to praise Him because the Spirit is moving powerfully where He wishes to move His Spirit, just as He did here on these two elders in the camp. Verse 27, And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Magad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant to Moses from his youth, said, my Lord Moses, stop them! A young man saw these two prophesying. It didn't seem right. He ran to Moses to tell him. Joshua heard it. And being a young man, he sells us for the things of God. He said, my Lord Moses, stop them, stop them from doing this. He appeals to Moses. They're not at the tabernacle. Why is this happening? They're not at the special religious place. Why are they out there speaking this way? They're not at the tabernacle. They're not with Moses, the holy leader of Israel. Stop them, Moses. They're out prophesying in the camp. Verse 29. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. What? If all God's people were prophets, and God put his spirit on them. Through all those centuries, the spirit in the old covenant came and went mysteriously on mysterious people. The spirit of God rushed on Saul and he slew Philistines. The spirit of God rushed on Samson and he delivered the people of God from the hand of the Philistines. The spirit of God moved through David. The Spirit of God moved through people that seemed incongruous. The Spirit of God came and went. But one impression we get out of that is that the Spirit is transitory in the Old Testament. The Spirit comes and goes. And we would be like Moses asking the question, Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put His Spirit on them? Now look at our story this morning from Numbers chapter 11. Notice the elements we have. Fire. Prophets, the Holy Spirit of God, but it was temporary. But what if it wasn't temporary? What if it was permanent? What if God's powerful spirit came and stayed with the people of God? What if that were to happen? And friends, the message of Pentecost, the message of this morning, is that the spirit has come. The spirit's come in power, and the spirit has stayed. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And remember, we saw last week who was there. We've got the eleven apostles minus Judas, who's gone off and committed suicide. We've got the women. 
We've got Jesus' family. His brothers are here as well. They got together in the upper room after Jesus ascended. Remember? Seven days prior to the day of Pentecost. One week. One period of sevens. The end of something has come with that seventh day. And here we've got the day of Pentecost. And the 120 are gathered in the upper room. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Remember the days of Moses? God's fire came. It came in judgment. It burned the edge of the camp. We're not told, but perhaps it burned people who were grumbling against the Lord. But now we see fire comes and rests on the people of God. Fire comes here on Pentecost, not in wrath, but in friendly, fierce power. Going on to verse 4 in Acts chapter 2. And they were filled, all of them, with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem. Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound of this, the multitude came together. And they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. We see that the 120 in the upper room have the Spirit come upon them. The fire of the Spirit comes upon them and they are not harmed. And they begin to prophesy. They begin to proclaim the good news. They begin to speak the words of God. And we know that they began to speak the words of God in languages that they didn't understand, but they weren't babbling incoherently. They were speaking in the languages of all these who gathered in Jerusalem to come together for the day of Pentecost. Their prophets, they were filled with the Spirit. And you are filled with the Spirit because He's here. Because when the Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, He stayed. He stayed. He's been indwelling the church and moving through the body of Christ for the last 2,000 years. He's been indwelling the hearts of believers for the last 2,000 years. He hasn't been coming and going like He did before, but He brings Jesus to us. And He stays with us. He's our comforter. He's our counselor. He's our friend. Moses said, Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put His Spirit on them. And friends, that has come to pass. He's here. The Spirit is here. In the classic Akira Kurosawa film, The Seven Samurai, the Japanese village is abused and viciously ruled over by a large band of bloodthirsty bandits. Their situation is impossible. Because the village is weak and no men are trained for war. And the bandits steal their food, wives, and daughters. In desperation, the village decides to recruit Ronin, masterless samurai, for hire to save them. They find a wizened old samurai named Kambe. And they plead with them to help them. But will they actually come? The villagers are nervous about their future. But suddenly, Kambe with six other samurai, are here, and now nothing seems impossible. As Kambe sets about arming and training the villagers and pre uh, preparing the village for a battle in which they defeat a wily and numerous enemy. The church existed in the Old Covenant, but God's people lived in a transitory state as the Holy Spirit came and went in a mysterious, limited way so that the people of God often fell prey to the hordes of Satan, who abused and viciously ruled over them like a band of bloodthirsty bandits. And they longed for the Holy Spirit to be powerful and permanently here. But the message of Pentecost is that in the wake of the resurrection and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon the community of warrior prophets, which is the church. We've seen this morning that the Spirit has arrived. And He's here. He's here. Soli Deo Gloria. To God alone be the glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless us, knowing and hearing, reminded once again that the Spirit is here. But may you bless us to sense His presence, which is always with us, to fill us with the power of the Holy Ghost to send us out these doors this day, this Pentecost day, in confidence that we might be proclaimers of your word, prophets of the living God, even this week. We pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Now that we've heard from the Lord through his word, let us respond back with our tithes and offerings, our tributes of the King. <coughs>
Bless our president, governor, legislators, and judges, that they might know you and fear you and give your people peace. Bless the Cardies as they assist Atherton's mother in this final stage of life. Please heal and strengthen Peter Rapp's brother, Eric. Please heal and cheer Rob Maddox in the midst of cancer. Please bless Tanya Calcote's mother, Verna, and her brother, Rob. Heal them and draw them close to you. Bless and grow the CREC Church in Porto Alegre, Brazil. Bless and mature the CREC Church in Santa Cruz and cause them to find a new pastor. Bless the CREC Church in Grand Junction, Colorado with their new pastor. Bless the CREC Church in Meeker, Colorado, that they might find a new pastor. Bless the CREC Church plant in Pleasanton, that they would grow and mature. Bless us here at Santa Clarita and in Christ Church. Bless the church across denominational lines to be revived and united. Bless the SCD Pregnancy Center in Mayor Valley, be an oasis of life. Cause Christian education to flourish and transform our city. Raise up godly fathers and mothers in our community to teach their children your word. Continue to form us as warriors of worship and song. Make us missionaries in our neighborhoods and workplaces. And bless us to build a cathedral in Santa Clarita. Make our marriages strong. Please heal and strengthen Marnie Allen and bless the Allen family in the midst of Marnie's illness. Please keep Nina Eastman and Kimberly Eastman and their babies safe and healthy. Bless our singles with spouses. Heal the sick among us and lift up the broken heart. Make us fruitful children at Christ Church. May our children never remember a day they did not know you. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And with hands up raised, we pray as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, and as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Here, brother. The Holy Spirit's here. Oftentimes we forget that He's here at the table. Some theologians have spoken of the Spirit as being the shy member of the triune God. He oftentimes draws attention not to Himself, but to the other members of the Trinity, the Father and the Son. But because the Spirit's here, we have Jesus. Jesus, the glorified man, seated at the right hand of the Father. Seated in reigning and ruling is brought to us in this table by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit brings Jesus to us, brings him to us in the bread, brings him to us in the wine, feeds us grace, transforms us more and more into the image of the Son of God. Who may come and take of this feast with us? Well, if you've been baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, you're not under the discipline of any Christian body, then we invite you to come and take with us. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and gave thanks. Let us give thanks for the body of Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son. Come into the world to redeem the world. Come to be broken, though sinless, that we who are filled with sin might be restored to you. We thank you for him, and it's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. And when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this as my memorial. And as the bread's are being passed, we're going to sing hymn number 200.
Brother, the body of Christ, broken to make you whole. Take and eat. In the same way, he took the cup, he also gave thanks. Let us give thanks for the blood of Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love so deep, so wide, that you sent your only begotten Son to come and shed his blood to wash away our sins, white as snow. We thank you for him. In Jesus' name, amen. And after the supper, he said, this is a cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it as my memorial. This is Pentecost, the day of the coming of the Spirit. No long faces, but pass to peace as the trays are passed. <coughs>
authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. With heads up raised like good warriors of the cross, receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and grant you peace.